Hey guys, it's Mrs. Invest. In this video, I'm going to show you how to invest in BlackRock iShares ETFs in Canada. Now, BlackRock iShares is just another fund similar to Vanguard, and I've already done a video on Vanguard, but basically they have many ETFs that you can choose to invest your money in. And my goal for this video today is going to be to take you through the website to break down all the different tabs and go through all the different terminology so you feel super comfortable navigating this website, understand what you're looking at so you are better better informed so you're able to make a good decision on which ETF you want to invest in. So first thing you can see uh, the website here I typed into Google BlackRock iShares Canada. Make sure you type in Canada because BlackRock does have a US website and if you go there um, you know you're going to be kind of led astray because everything is made for um, Americans. So click here on investment funds and you get to the home page. So first click on products and you can see there are basically two broad categories of products that they offer, the iShares ETFs and the mutual funds. So um, mutual funds, if you've watched my videos, you know they're not my favorite thing. So I'm gonna kind of start with the ETFs here. So under ETFs, you have three different categories of ETFs, of big umbrellas of types of ETFs. Equity here means that the ETF is going to be holding exclusively individual stocks. So it, it may hold a lot of stocks, it could hold thousands of stocks, but it's only going to be holding stocks. There's not going to be any bonds or any other type of asset in those ETFs. Um, these are typically going to be um, have higher returns and they're also going to be more volatile. So a little bit of that high risk, high reward, but going to make you pretty good returns over the long term type of investment. Next, you have your fixed income. These are where you're going to be getting your bonds. Honestly, I don't hold any of these and I've never actually clicked on this. So we're going to go through this together and see what this uh, fixed income thing is all about. Basically, these are your bonds. These are where you're going to be getting lower returns, significantly lower returns over the long term than the equity, but also less volatility. So less fluctuation in your portfolio. Um, but to have that stability, the trade-off is you are going to be getting lower returns. So those are typically for people who are, let's say, not willing to tolerate volatility in their portfolio for one reason or another. Maybe you just emotionally, are, it's not for you. It would cause you too much stress. Or maybe you are in retirement and you want um, you know, really stable returns and you don't want to see your portfolio fluctuating like crazy when you're trying to live off of it. And then commodities are just other assets that you can invest in like typically like precious metals. Um, so that's not a huge focus of this video today. So under equities, you're going to click right here. And you'll see a drop down of all the different equity based ETFs that BlackRock offers. Now, pretty much all of these, if you watched my Vanguard video, all of these types of ETFs are offered by Vanguard as well. And you might say, well, why pick one over the other? And honestly, you're really splitting hairs. Like some people just like Vanguard better. Some people like BlackRock. Some ETFs between the two of them, like two of the same identical type ETFs, may one may have like a slightly better management fee or honestly, it's really personal decision. It's just like multiple options of the same thing. Um, so not to say that Vanguard's any better or BlackRock's any better. It's just different options. So for example here, <laughs> now, all these three letter little words here are kind of the name of the ETF. So when you hear someone say XIU, you know exactly this means that this is the TSX 60 in Canada, which is basically the 60 biggest companies on the Toronto Stock Exchange in Canada. And after a while of looking at this, all these names, eventually it's kind of scary how much you memorize these names. Like you could pretty much list any of these three letter things and I could probably like recite this entire word for you or like this entire explanation just because I've looked at these so many times but don't get confused at the beginning eventually you will literally memorize them just because you get it after a while so XIU is a super popular one one reason people love it is because it's been around for a long time and it's super liquid and um, you know it's one of these like household names of BlackRock. It's kind of like the Kleenex of BlackRock. Everybody knows XIU. So let's just go through this page and we'll use XIU as an example. And a lot of the things I'm going to talk about in navigating this, you know, what all this means 
you can transfer it to looking at pretty much any ETF, but you know, I have to just pick one to look at. So we'll pick this one and then maybe we'll do a couple more. So I'll just kind of show you what I like to look at on these websites. What, what things am I paying attention to? Which things are less important? And just hopefully as if you were sitting right behind beside me here and like I was explaining this to you, hopefully you, I can help you guys feel like you understand what you're looking at. That's my goal. Okay. So this is the name. If you don't understand what this means, don't worry. BlackRock does a really nice job of explaining what's within the ETF. So for me, I look at this and I say, okay, S&P TSX 60. I know this means it's the 60 largest stocks on the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange. But let's say you didn't know what that meant. So if you go right here, YXIU, exposure to large established Canadian companies. It's one of the largest and most liquid ETFs. And it's been around for a long time, as I said. Um, and what is, what is the goal of this ETF? Well, it's completely passive because it just tracks basically the S&P TSX 60 and you are getting long-term capital growth, which means appreciation in the price of the shares. Here you see YTD, that's the date, uh, the return to date this year. These numbers are a little skewed because we're coming out of the 2020 crash. So all like returns, if you're comparing them starting around 2020, you know, they seem artificially high because of the crash. So I don't really pay too much of attention to that because of the uh, plague. So let's go down here. Love this part. Super important. Okay. Um, I really like how, how BlackRock na like lays out their website. It's super appealing to the eye. It's just a nice layout. It's very user-friendly. I have to say, I like the website better than Vanguard's, especially if you're a beginner and you're confused about what these, all this stuff means. So performance. This is where this is where where I said equity based ETFs they are going to give you greater returns over time but the trade off is you are going to have more short term volatility. So for this ETF the one year return is 28. Now again this is re the recovery from the crash so it's artificially inflated. I would ignore that number. Um, three year 11 and a half percent. So if you held this ETF three years ago, you would have returned yourself 11.5 percent on your investment. Not too shabby considering you don't have to do anything except hold it, which is honestly the hardest part sometimes is just holding and not selling and panicking and doing something silly. I know it seems silly, but honestly, sometimes holding and just not doing anything is like the hardest part with investing. You just have to give things time. Um, your five-year return here is 10% and your 10-year return is 9%. Now you'll see this one is largely based in Canada. So the 10-year return is 9%, which is still amazing. But you'll see later when we look at the US ETF, you're going to have higher returns um, with a US broad market simply because the US economy, the US um, a total market and the S&P is just, it's, there's so much more growth within the US. And again, if you watch my videos, you know I love investing in the U.S. stock market for this reason. So certainly 9% is nothing to sneeze at at all. It's a great return for having to do absolutely no stock picking, no work, no monitoring, buying and selling stress. It's a great return for the average person. However, you will see typically Canadian passive ETFs, you're going to have a slightly lower return than the U.S. simply because the U.S. is a more, much more robust market. And incept here means since, since inception. So since this ETF was created, what has been the total return? So this is, when was it created here? 1990. So since 1990, your average return will be 7.6%. That's pretty typical long-term for a Canadian-based ETF. Again, great return. Uh, way better than what you're going to get in a mutual fund or a savings account or worse, holding cash and doing nothing or even worse, spending it uh, uh, at Lewis Vuitton on a depreciating purse asset. But don't get me started on that. Um, so here you can see the growth of $10,000. This is a, just a really nice visual, honestly. So you can pick up here. Let's see. Oh, five years ago. If I invested five years ago, today this would be valued at 16950 so 17000 And you see what I mean here about equities. This was the plague uh, disaster in the market. When you have equity-based ETFs, you have to expect these types of – sorry, this bar is all over – you have to expect these types of corrections. This is something you really have to prepare yourself going into – equity, anything equity, anything stock based, there will be volatility. Now, I know this drop is so big, it makes every other drop seem like minuscule, like this one seems so small in comparison, this one seems so small in comparison, this one seems so small. But all of these 
like in live time were actually really big drops. It's just this one is like, you know, once in a lifetime thing that was so big, it makes these seem small. But you can see like if you just hold over the long term, you're going to do well. But the ride to get there is not linear. It's not straight up like this. It's going to be bumpy. So this is just something to, uh, you know, psychologically prepare yourself for with any equity based ETF. And again, if you watch my channel, I really do talk a lot about the emotional, psychological aspect of investing because I don't think that it gets talked about enough. And sometimes, you know, when it comes to you, our money, we're so emotional with it and we have like a you know deep attachment to it that we tend to panic if we see our, our investments going down. And really, we can be our own worst enemy with investing. You know, like imagine if this person bought at $10,000 and then even this crash here, imagine if they panic sold and you know, they panic sold it to at 10,200, they bought it at 10,000, you know, they held for a few years, they only made $200. And looking at back today, they've missed out on $7,000 of returns. So it's really, these are not things you trade short term. I mean, you can, but these, not just XIU, but any ETF, Vanguard, BlackRock, iShares, these are not for trading. These are for storing money in long term holding, set it and forget it, crockpot investing. Okay. Um, next thing, key facts, another, you know, relatively important thing to look at. So you can see it's super liquid. It has tons of assets under its management. The exchange, Toronto Stock Exchange, that's the TSX, and its number of holdings. So these are the number of individual stocks this ETF holds. You can see here it's 60. It is the S&P TSX 60, so that's not a surprise. The price per share, well, it's technically not a share because it's not a stock. You call it ETFs, it's a price per unit. So unit, basically think of it as share. It's kind of the same thing, but different word. Asset class, equity. When you see equity, you think this ETF holds only stocks. Um, ba -ba -ba, moving along. Can you drip this? Yes, that's great. You get your distribution. And most of these ETFs will pay out a distribution. It's a cash payment that comes to you just for holding the ETF. It's not a dividend. It's not eligible for the Canadian dividend tax credit, but it is cash nonetheless. You can reinvest the cash. You can transfer the cash into your checking account and go to Taco Bell. You can do whatever you want. Um, eligible for registered plans means can you hold this ETF in your registered accounts, meaning TFSA and RRSP. The non-registered account is a, or the taxable account is a non-registered account. So registered here means basically AKA TFSA, RRSP. And yes, you can, honestly, I don't know of any ETF that you can't hold in your registered accounts. Like I don't think I've ever seen this say no, but just so you know what that means. PE ratio, I mean, I find this kind of not important at all for the ETF. Like it holds so many stocks. It just averages out the PE ratio. So it's like a pretty meaningless number to me, honestly. Distribution yield. This is where you see how much you're going to get paid out in cash. So 2.53%. Now that's not your total return. Remember, if we looked up here, your total return, depending on the time frame you were looking at, this is the total return dividend, sorry, not, not dividend, distribution plus capital appreciation, let's say 10 years was 9%. But of that 9%, you were getting paid, you know, 2.5% in cash. When you think of distribution, think of money that gets deposited in my account that I can go to Taco Bell. So part of that 9% was paid out to you as a cash payment. The rest of it was appreciation of the share price. You can see, remember this chart here, this is a uh, share price going up over time. Um, okay, this, honestly, not important at all. Um, also not important, not important. Fees, very important. Okay. Management fee, 0.15%. This is great. You know, uh, everybody has like a different benchmark. For me, any fee that's under 0.25% is 0.25%, I think is a pretty good fee. Once you start getting above 0 0.25, 0 0.3, that's when things start to get a little bit high. But, and you might think like, oh my goodness, it's zero point something. Isn't that super low? Well, not really. If you watch my video on the power of compounding, um, you'll see how much, especially once you start having portfolio of hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, management fees literally 
can eat up hundreds of thousands of dollars over the lifetime of your portfolio once you start getting into like the crazy management fee world of like a managed portfolio, like a portfolio manager that you hire who's charging you two, three percent to manage your for- manage your money or mutual funds even. They have like 1.5 percent to two percent fees. And um, if you've in my video, I've talked about the power of compounding and part of compounding is minimizing fees. How, how do I say this? In order to match the market return, if you have a management fee of, let's say, 2%, the person managing your money needs to beat the market by 2%, more than 2% per year in order to give you market return because they want, like, they need to get paid too. And if they're charging you 2%, they need to give you, they need to beat the market managing your portfolio in, let's say, a mutual fund just to get you average market return. So why would you... Why would you take that risk when you could just invest in a passive ETF that tracks the broad market and you have a super low management fee? You've basically eliminated the the risk of an individual person screwing up, picking the wrong stocks for you. And we'll get into this later when I when I go to the mutual fund uh, page here. But that's kind of the long and short of it. The lower the fees, especially for passive ETFs, you'll find they're generally lower, the better. Once you start getting into actively managed ETFs, meaning somebody behind a desk is picking stocks to try and beat the market those people obviously need to get paid and so you're going to be getting um you're going to be paying more for that service but now a lot of controversy about this everybody has their own opinion but long-term studies show that it's almost impossible for an individual to beat the market every year over the long term they may beat it, beat it some years. They're probably going to miss it most years. And over the long term, the average market return is probably going to beat an individual stock picker. Um, and that's really the essence of why I don't invest in mutual funds. I don't trust any individual person to beat the market over the long term. And so with these passive ETFs, the fees are low. You get average market return. And you know, for the average person who's just looking to get their money working for them, it's a really, really great thing. It's easy to invest in. Crockpot investing. Now, risk indicator, medium. Don't let this scare you. You know, you might think, oh my goodness, I want low risk. Um, anything that is equity based is going to be like at least medium risk because you're holding stocks. And so risk doesn't mean, you know, the risk that you're going to lose all your money. It means the risk that you're going to be experiencing volatility that, you know, if you buy something today, two years from now, it's possible it could be valued less than what you initially bought it for. So kind of like short term risk. If you're investing anything stock based, the risk is there short term, long term, you will almost certainly win and have a great return over the long term. So whenever you feel yourself getting nervous seeing these risk indicators, just remember that these are all long term plays. And without risk, you cannot make great returns. So equity based, you're going to have some risk. And finally, here you can see the top holdings. It's kind of nice to just look at this just to see, you know, what is this ETF actually holding? And, you know, uh, the Canadian economy, it's financials, it's energy, and it's pretty, pretty few sectors make up the large percent. So there's no surprise here that you're going to see Royal Bank, one of my favorite stocks, by the way, TD Bank, another great one. Love BAM. People, not enough people invest in BAM. I own a lot of BAM.A. A, by the way, is for the Canadians because there's a US based BAM uh, stock. Um, love BAM, great company. I think I really have to do a video on this one. Enbridge is good, good company. I just personally don't invest in uh, anything oil. Again, more banks, Bank Nova Scotia, Bank Montreal, CIBC, and Energy. So, you know, none of this should be surprises. This is the backbone of the Canadian economy. And again, another nice little visual breakdown of, you know, where the sectors are within this ETF. Okay, let's go to a different one. I just want to show you um, a US-based ETF now. Actually, before we go to a US-based one, because that was a lot of talking, let's just, I'm just going to break down these individual ETFs, explain quickly what they're about and what their Vanguard counterpart is. So XIU, I'm not sure if Vanguard has a, I'm sure maybe they do. I don't know off, off the top of my head if they have a specific TSX 60, but XIC is basically like XIU's little brother. It's a newer ETF. It's uh, less liquid, but you know, still fairly liquid, meaning you'll be able to sell it. No problem. There'll always be a buyer for this ETF. Um, and this is essentially 
at the entire Canadian stock market. So every single stock on the Canadian stock market is XIC. The top 60 companies are XIU and the Vanguard counterpart of XIC is uh, VCN, I believe. Okay, um, XSP is your S&P 500, but Canadian hedged. I do talk about hedging in my video called How to Invest in the U.S. Stock Market for Canadians near the end of the video if you want to watch uh, you know, watch uh, or learn specifically about hedging. I get a lot of questions about this, so I could do a video just on hedging if you guys want. Let me know. Um, but uh, XSP is your S&P 500 hedged, and the Vanguard equivalent of that would be VSP. Uh, Misi, Ifi, Emi, we're going to leave that one for now. Uh, okay, you got your, your non-hedged S&P 500 is XUS, and we all know the Vanguard equivalent, my favorite, VFE. U.S. total market is XUU, Vanguard's is VUN, V-U-N. Uh, XAW, you have your whole world, so owning everything international uh, except for Canada. And uh, the Vanguard equivalent of that is, they have a couple, but VXC, I would say, is the closest. Here you have your dividend ETF, uh, XDV, and the Vanguard equivalent. Again, Vanguard has a few of them, but VDY would be an example. So again, a lot of these are duplicated. You can kind of compare between the two if you're thinking of you wanting to invest in the, you know, a particular type of ETF and kind of see who you like better, Vanguard or BlackRock. It's nice to just uh, be able to shop around, I guess. Okay, this video is going to be long. Hope you guys have a snack, but I don't want to leave anything out. Okay, do we want to do U.S. total market or the S&P? Well, let's do the S&P. What the heck? Okay, so here you have your S&P, the top 500 companies in the U.S. market. Uh, per, per unit is going to be $69. So you buy and sell these just like stocks. You enter the order, type in XUS, how many shares you want each. Well, again, it's not a share, it's a unit. How many units you want? $69 per unit of the ETF. And what is this? 500 largest companies, low cost, long term core holding. Okay, I uh, just want to make a quick mention here. Again, you can see what I was talking about with XIU and the returns when you the US market is more robust. So here you have your five year return at 15.5%. If you bought a share, a unit, God, I always mess that up. If you bought a unit five years ago, you held it to today, you would have 15% return. And again, remember, this 15% return is compounded. So you make 15% on your initial investment in one year. And then the next year, you make 15% on what you initially invested plus the growth of the previous year. So it grows exponentially. Uh, that's really the beauty of you know investing in general is, is compounding and the ability to compound your money. But again, that takes time. The return since inception is 17%. I mean, this is just, this is remarkable. Like, go and find somebody on the street. Go outside right now and ask them, any manager, can you get me confidently 17% over the long term? They will laugh at you and send you out the door. They'll say, well, you know, we'll be able, we can guarantee maybe 5%. And then anything above that, you know, is just bonus. 17% for doing absolutely nothing other than holding and buying. This is really just remarkable. I can't emphasize this enough. This is just fantastic, fantastic long-term core holding. Uh, and then when you see the fees associated to get 17%, I mean, it's a no-brainer. If you're a beginner, you're experienced. The S&P is for everybody. It's like air. Everybody needs it. Okay, and you see this chart here. Compare it to the XIU little bit wonky there. I think I did the five year with XIU, right? Now, if you compare the slope here, if you're everybody remember grade nine math, Y equals MX plus B, the slope is much steeper than XIU. Again, more growth, US market, not a surprise. But again, you've got your equities here. So you're going to be suffering ups and downs uh, all over the year. So what I like to do is, you know, I pretty much buy consistently because it's hard to time things. I mean, who could have imagined this disaster right here? Nobody saw it coming. I buy pretty consistently. But when I see a dip, actually, the uh, S&P uh, has dipped recently. It's a good time to buy recently, actually. It's gone down a couple dollars, you know, five or six percent from uh, its recent peak. Whenever I see these kind of dips here, this is when I tend to load up because I know VFV, or sorry, I have Vanguard in this one, but this one's fine too, whatever the heck this one's called. What is it? Uh, XS, uh, XSP or whatever. Uh, you know, whenever these dip, 
you know, I know the S&P is a behemoth, it's going to come back. So I use these opportunities as time to load up. I don't get scared that it's going down. I see it as an opportunity to buy more at a discount. And you know, that is a great mentality, because if you can catch the dips, and again, I'm not advocating for market timing, I'm just saying, if you can load up on dips, if you have the cash available, that just increases your return, because not only are you getting the average market return of this here 17% on average since inception, um, you're also in increasing the return by getting more sh more units when it has you know the it, the price has depreciated. So love buying these on love buying my S and P on dips, but also you know it's great to buy all the time. Just add to it slowly over time. Set it and forget it. Crockpot investing holds 500 stocks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, S and P 500. No uh, no uh, surprise there. Distribution yield, 0.89. So you're not going to get a high yield here. It doesn't matter. You get the capital growth. I like to keep the S&P, uh, you know, Canadian-based S&P. So VFV or, my God, what is this one called? XUS. I completely miscalled it earlier, but whatever. XUS. I don't personally hold this one. I hold the exact same thing with Vanguard. They're both great. No reason why I have Vanguard over this one is literally just a flip of a coin. You don't get much distribution here because... Uh, you get the capital growth. So um, uh, the, the lower the distribution in cash, the less the less the lesser the immediate tax burden on your investment. Because remember, if you have capital growth, you don't pay tax on those that growth until you start to sell the shares or sell the units. When you get a distribution payout, you are paying tax immediately that tax year on the distribution. So VFE, great one. Honestly, it's great to hold in any account. But I like holding it. Uh, I have it a lot of it in my taxable account for this reason that the tax the immediate tax burden is low uh on the distribution compared to let's say the xi uxic which was like a two and a half percent yield little thing but kind of kind of fun to think about uh you know once you know once you do this long enough you think it starts to get a bit boring so you kind of look for a little fun thing fun ways to you know maximize your returns over time and that that's just one of them there but it's a great thing to hold in any account you hold it in your tfsa you're going to get great growth over time you know, it can't can't really go wrong here, I don't think. Unless you panic sell, then you can go wrong every time. Okay, management fee. I mean, come on. 0 0.09. It's so low. There's two zeros in front. I I just, I really, I don't have enough words to say how much I like the S&P. It's been so good to me. I think it's going to be so good in the future. And I think this is just a great investment for everybody. Low to medium risk. I don't know why they call this one low and they call the Canadian one medium. I have no idea. Maybe they think the, the U.S. market is more robust and less likely to collapse. And again, top holdings, they hold the U.S. version. So the U.S. dollar version of the BlackRock S&P is IVV traded in U.S. dollars. So they hold basically that ETF. And then they hold the big boys in here, the big, e, the big 500. You all know these names. No surprise that the, those are held there. Okay. What else? Okay, so um, I want to go over one more, the dividend index ETF, because I do get a lot of questions about that. But before we do that, I want to jump over to the mutual funds, because I think it's going to be very interesting to compare the returns you get on mutual funds versus our broad market of the Canadian and US that we just went over. Now, I have actually never been, hello, products. I have never actually been to this tab. I have no idea what I'm about to see, uh, and I almost am going to certainly bet. I'm just going to take a bet right now. I literally promise you guys I've never been here before. I'm going to bet that they are going to be very, very, very hidden, both the management fee and the return. You see on the ETFs how you know they put it right there in front of your face. You can't miss it if, unless you're not looking. Mutual funds, I feel like they're going to be – most of them are very sneaky. They don't show you what your returns are tip, historically. They don't show you what the management fee is because the fees are so high, they try and hide them. But I could be wrong. Let, let, I don't want to be a pessimist, but let's just, let's have a look. Okay. Now just bear with me here because I've literally never been here. Okay. So you have your bond, mutual funds, skip that. Balanced, I guess that means, you know, a bit risky, a bit conservative, conservative, defensive. This is like a dividend type monthly income. Okay, growth. Let's look at this. Okay, let's go to max growth. Let's click on this. Are you kidding? You're joking. 
Okay, see, this is what I mean. You can't even click on it. I'm literally clicking here. Look, listen. Okay, that's me clicking. Wh why, why can I not click on this? I, I shouldn't have come here. This is, I'm going to be going down a rabbit hole now. Why can I not click on it? Like, there's no information. I'm supposed to buy this. I don't know anything about it. Okay, you know what? Let me Google it. Because I'm sure there will be information on it. On some website. Okay. Let's see here. What is this about? So $13 per unit. Okay, fine. That really doesn't mean anything at all. Um, okay, here we go. Here we go. The cat's out of the bag, people. MER, 0.92. The management fee is almost 1%, and they hide it. I had to search on Google to find this. Why is this information not available on the website? Why can I not click on this? This is very upsetting to me. This is this is unsuspecting people are going to be trapped. Unsuspecting people are going to be sucked into this high management fee. And look at this. Look, year to date, negative 3.92%. Negative. I'm paying one. This got to be. No, this has to be wrong. This can't be. I'm going to pay 1% nearly in management fees to lose money to date. Now, if the market, like if the broad market was down, which does happen, you know, there's down years, but the S&P is up huge this year. The TSX is up huge. So the broad market is up. So excuse me, why is this down? Why, why is the year to date? Why is the return this year negative 4%? This is not accept. This got to be a mistake. This has to be a mistake. Okay. Let's look up this again. Can I click on this? No. This is so disappointing. Okay. And again, a mutual fund means it's not it's not passive so the fund is not just passively tracking the broad market you have people hired behind desks to try and pick stocks based on what the fund is trying to accomplish so you know for this one it would be growth for this one it would be max growth i don't know what kind of max growth negative 4% is maybe neg maybe max loss it should be called uh, but anyways you know max growth assuming it should be at least minimum getting the return of the broad market. I would assume if I'm paying 1%, you better be getting me more than the broad market. This is, this ha no, maybe that's a mistake. I don't want to jump to conclusions. I didn't mean for this to become a comedy show here, but now I've, I'm too deep into this money to figure out what's going on here. Let's see. So this is the growth. We looked at max growth before. What's going on here? No. No. 1.72. Can you believe that? It's, it can't be. It is, but it can't. 1.72. Year to day. No. Negative 1%. This, can, this, is, this is wrong. I'm so mad. Unsuspecting people. They, you can't even click on it on the website. I can't. I can't believe this. See, this is why it's so important to be financially literate, to understand what you're investing in. Because, you know, for example, the banks, they also have mutual funds run through the banks. And it's the same nonsense, huge fees. And, you know, no guarantee of a return because you're relying on somebody to pick stocks for you. And, you know, the reality is, they're not going to be right every year. So it seems like they're not doing very well this year. But my goodness, the management fee is higher than the return. And the return is negative. Never mind. It, even if it was positive 1.61, the management fee would be higher. I mean, if you're still with me in this video, this very long video, thank you. But I'm. this is just, I need to get off this page. I'm going to have an aneurysm. Okay, moving right along. Let's leave. Let's go back here. I can't believe that. My God. Okay. I just quickly want to go over, oh, I feel better now. Okay, I just really quickly want to go over the dividend index ETF because I do get some comments about that sometimes. Like, hey, Mrs. Invest, do you invest in individual dividend stocks or do you have an ETF that just holds a bunch of dividend stocks? So <clears throat> this is your Canadian dividend ETF. The reason you would buy this is you want yield. You want cash payments over capital growth of the unit, of the, of the share price, unit price, whatever. 
So here you're going to be seeing in the holdings here, the big dividend pairs in Canada, financials, energy, you know, we can go right down to the bottom, you're going to see all the banks here, CIBC, BMO, Royal, Energy, B B uh, BCE, Bank Nova Scotia, TD Bank, National Bank, all these are great. All these are great. Uh, is, is, can, you, can you go wrong here? No. Do I personally don't invest in dividend index ETFs? Now, this is totally personal. It's not that I don't like them. I can confidently say I do not like mutual funds. And actually, I may actually, uh, after seeing what we just saw, I may actually say I greatly dislike mutual funds. I don't, uh, this, this dividend ETF is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, you're definitely going to see a lower yield because your, um, these companies are extremely stable. They're big, you know, Royal Bank, TV Bank, they can only grow so much more. They're very established companies and you're getting a lot of the payout as cash. You're not getting, you see the slope here. It's not as steep as the, as the broad market TSX and S&P 500 or US total market. So you're going to expect with this type of yield, uh, this type of return to be lower than those. But again, the main reason you're buying these is for cash. So let's say someone has, you know, a million dollars invested in dividend stocks or a dividend ETF. They're going to be getting, well, let me tell you here, almost 4% distribution distributed to them yearly. So, you know, uh, $39,200 on a million dollars invested. You know, that's a great living wage uh, or at least a, a beginning part of your passive income to live so you don't have to work anymore. So that's great. Uh, the reason I don't personally invest in these is a very specific reason, but it's totally personal to me. And, you know, it's nothing bad. It's just kind of a personal thing is that I like to control the price that I buy my dividend stocks at because when you buy them low, your yield is higher from day one. So the dividend payout in dollars is the same, but your yield is higher if you buy the, buy the, uh, buy the stock at a cheaper price. And so I like to get into my dividend stocks. I mean, ideally at a day one yield of 5%, basically that means any of the banks, you're buying them on a dip. So I like buying on them on a dip. And I also find that, you know, it's a lot easier to catch an individual stock on a dip than it is to catch an ETF on a dip. Because basically in order to catch an ETF on a dip, the entire market pretty much needs to be down. Like it needs to be like a widespread market correction because there's so many stocks in each individual ETF that, um, that you know, if one's, one company's down, it has bad earnings, let's say the rest of the stocks are not affected by that. So they're going to kind of help it, you know, hold it up. Um, and same thing for these dividend companies, dividend payers, dividend aristocrats, you know, the chance of all of these stocks dipping at the same time is pretty low unless the market goes down. But, you know, Bank of Nova Scotia, let's say, they might have bad press come out and a stock may tank for whatever reason. And, you know, that's the time I like to get in because I get get the shares cheap and then I have a great yield from day one. That's a lot harder to accomplish when you're buying an ETF that holds all of the stocks. So really, that's my reasoning is I just like to hold the shares by themselves. And then I can also monitor kind of, you know, um, the dividend raises and how the company is doing in terms of um, in terms of raising the dividend yearly. It's what I like to see with my dividend stocks. I did a big video on dividends called Dividends Demystified. It's a good one if you want to watch, kind of pretty much go into everything about dividends. But that's pretty much my TLDR is I just like buying dividend paying stocks individually. The stocks management fee here is super low. Actually, it's not that low, actually, 0.5. It's getting up there. And again, why would I pay 0.5% when I can just buy the stocks myself and I like to concentrate into a few dividend pairs? Like I don't need all of these. I kind of focus in on the ones I really like, a couple of them, and then I just add. So um, let's quickly go here to fixed income. Again, you'll just see these are going to be essentially similar similarly laid out to the equity but it's just going to be bonds bond 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 i don't personally hold any bonds but they definitely have a place in certain portfolios when you want to be a bit more defensive typically you'll see the bonds in portfolios of people who are older not to be ageist but you know it is a thing when you're older you tend to be drawing on your portfolio more and you're less tolerant to volatility and commodities here um are your you know precious metals so that's my recap of the BlackRock iShares website. I really hope that was useful for you guys. I tried to come at it in a way to explain things um, 
for any beginner to understand. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel and you can follow me on Twitter if you like at Mrs. Invest One. Uh, sorry about my mutual fund rant. I really <laughs> was not uh, not expecting to see that. Um, uh, but there you go. You got my raw, unfiltered opinion of seeing what these mutual funds are all about on BlackRock. So uh, anyways, uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.